So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You're very welcome to this afternoon's launch of Historical Irish Dairy Products, uh, a book uh, which uh, presents the chronological perspective of the evolution of dairy products in Ireland. And today we're coming to you live from uh, the Chagas headquarters in Oak Park. And I'm delighted uh, to be joined by a very distinguished panel of, of speakers today. Uh, to my left, uh, we have Dr. Liam Downey, former director of Chagask. Liam, you're very welcome. Uh, we have the current director of Chagask, Professor Frank O'Mara. And we have the former director uh, of Chagask, uh, Jerry Boyle. And we also have Derry O'Donovan, uh, who is the author of the book, and also a former AIB uh, Agri uh, uh, Manager there in, uh, in former life. So. Uh, we also have joining us online, we have Dr. Dara Downey, who lectures in English in Trinity College and is also an author of the book. So today we're going to uh, hear uh, uh, some, uh, some history about the book itself. And so I'm now going to, uh, before we do that, I'm now going to invite uh, Professor Frank O'Mara to say a few words of welcome. And uh, just a reminder to you that uh, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A tab. Uh, we would love if you have any questions that you'd like us to put to the panel. Uh, we can do that if you just type your question in uh, uh, and uh, send it through to us. So I now hand over to Professor Frank O'Mara uh, to welcome our, uh, you all today. Thanks very much, Mark, and everybody. You're all very welcome here. Unfortunately, we cannot physically welcome you to this launch. But look, I think um, it's testament to the advances that we have made uh, in, in over the years that we were able to do an event like this uh, virtually and from all corners of the world, we can we can join here in this launch today. So look, um, today is it is a great occasion, I think, to launch a book like this, Historical Irish Dairy Products. And I'm delighted that we are joined by the, the authors of, of the book. That's um, Liam Downey, uh, Dara Downey, who again is joining us virtually uh, for this event uh, today, and, and Derry O'Donovan. And um, I think it's fantastic uh, Liam, what, what, what you and your co-authors have done in relation to this book. And it's great that you're here with us today. And it's also great to be joined by my predecessor, Jerry Boyle. And I was reflecting, um, you know, as, as we were sitting here waiting for this to start, I'm in this role as director of Chagas for about 10 weeks now at this stage. And the two uh, other directors that are here in the room uh, with me uh, led the organization between them for about 20 years. So I feel very minuscule uh, in my role in comparison to the, the roles that, that Jerry and Liam have played in leading the organization and also how well they, they both did it during their, their times. And they're certainly, you know, and both an inspiration and um, a challenge for me to try to do as good a job as they did in their time. So th this book, really, it's about the, the history of the dairy industry in Ireland. And I suppose mo many of us, we're probably familiar with the dairy industry as it is now and, and its recent journey. Uh, since um, I suppose the last big milestone that it had was the elimination of milk quotas, the European uh, Union milk quotas. And we now have an industry with, with 1.6 uh, million dairy cows approximately. There's 17,000 farmers involved in, in producing milk. Uh, it's a very profitable industry at farm level. We, we recently had our review and outlook conference and uh, dairy farm incomes you know, grew very strongly in 2021. Um, we have an industry that exports over 3 billion worth of product to all corners of, of the world. It has one of the, the lowest uh, carbon footprints uh, of milk production in, in the world. And that allows the industry you know, to, to position itself as a seller of premium products. And it's remarkable, for instance, the story of Kerrygold butter and how on some of the biggest markets in the world, such as the US and the German market, it is the premium product. And, and you know, that, so, so it's a fantastic story for a small country like Ireland to have developed an industry uh, like that. And I suppose what this book allows us to do is reflect on, on the story of that industry from its earliest uh, times. And I think that the book, it goes back several thousand years in terms of how, how that industry has developed and, and what were the, the key steps and technologies along that way. And look, I, I know it's, it's, it's not um, in terms of the, the actual business or commerce of our, our dairy industry, uh, you know, th th there's many, many factors come into that. But I think it's always great to have an understanding of where you've come from in terms of knowing where, where you might be going to go in, in the future with any endeavor or any industry. So um, 
so look, I, I, I think that's, that's probably all I want to say at this juncture of, of today's event. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing a little bit more about the book uh, from, from Liam, and uh, I'm, I would commend, I suppose, all of you uh, to have a look at the book afterwards, and, and we'll talk a bit about that uh, later on in the afternoon. So I'll hand you back now to Mark. Okay, thank you, Frank. And uh, just while Liam is uh, getting uh, set up for his, his talk, just to sh show you a copy of the book here. Uh, the book is available on the WordWell website, uh, wordwell.com. So uh, if you order now, uh, I'm sure uh, it can be with you uh, by Christmas time. Uh, and the book is also available in uh, a lot of bookstores uh, across uh, the country as well. So uh, if you want to get a copy, uh, there's, there's lots of ways of doing that. So now I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Liam Downey to uh, present uh, uh, his, the overview of the book. Uh, so I'll hand over to Liam. Thank you, Mark. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us in this very important event. Now the book, as you have already heard, aims to show you the evolution, the progressive evolution of dairy products in Ireland over a very long time. It traces the evolution of Irish dairy products from prehistory, from the Bronze Age, Iron Age, through the medieval period, and on into modern times. What it really does, it presents a joint up account of all that development, because some of that has been previously reported in discrete publications, but the whole thing has never been joined up, to the best of my knowledge. And there's a timeline in the book that shows the development of the dairy products over three to 4,000 years graphically. You've already heard there are three authors of the book, and we're here one way or the other at the moment. And I would like to begin by acknowledging the contribution, the very generous contribution of Tagus to the book. Without their sponsorship, it would not have happened. And I'd also like to say how much we appreciate the quality of the book that was produced by uh, Wardwell. It surpassed my expectations. Now, when one looks at the history of Irish dairy products, butter is of overwhelming importance. In, in fact, butter is almost another name for Ireland in that regard. And every source of information that one cares to look at, from prehistory through the medieval period on into early times, butter comes out again and again and again as the prominent product. But we also were involved in cheese, and I will touch upon that later. I'm going to cover three historical periods. I'm going to start with the prehistoric period. I'll define that in a moment. And then going to move to the medieval period onwards. And finally, I'll come to modern times. So the prehistoric period, what period am I talking about? I'm talking about from 2300 BC, the Bronze Age, right up to 400 AD, up to the time of St. Patrick. Now, we're very good, lucky that we have a lot of samples of bog butter that goes back to that time. As many people will know, farmers have over decades been digging up bog butter when they were cutting turf. And there are hundreds of samples in the National Museum. And about 15 years ago, a major project was embarked upon in Moor Park in Tigers to actually have a scientific look at bog butter. And I'm going to touch upon some of the conclusions of that. But the most important thing we did is we dated the butter in conjunction with the National Museum. But since then, Professor Chris Sennett from UCC has uh, dated a good few other samples of bog butter. So we have dates now for about 30 samples of bog butter. The interesting thing, really, the important thing about the dating is that well over half of the samples are dated from the Bronze Age and Iron Age. Oh yeah, they go on later but over half are from that period. In some respects, Ireland has the oldest scientifically dated butter in the world. It goes back over three to 4,000 years. Now I want to touch upon some interesting features of the research that came up that we did. 
And the first thing is that the butter put into the bog is completely de decomposed. In fact, if you took a sample and send a blind sample to a chemist and asked him to analyze it, he wouldn't recognize it as butter because it isn't butter. Not only that, he wouldn't recognize it as a fat because it isn't a fat either. It's a kind of a soap because it's completely degraded. Now, the next interesting thing, which I would like you to reflect upon, because you might have an answer to this, which has given me a little bit of bother. The vast majority of bog butter samples are west of the Shannon. There are some samples in the rest of the country, but they take two very contrasting counties. There's over 30 samples of bog butter have been, have been found in Mayo, in my own county, in Cork, which is supposed to be re renowned for dairying. One. Now, why do you think that is so? Of course, you're going to tell me there's more bogs west of the Shannon, which there are. You're also going to tell me that more turf was cut west of the Shannon, and it probably was. But West Cork isn't short of bogs, you know. So why do you think that that geographical differentiation exists? Probably the most interesting thing, though, is that a number of the samples were found in timber containers. They were medieval drinking vessels. And if you could see one of them and look down into it, it's square with a handle on each corner. In the book, there is a picture of that vessel, which is called a medder, it was a wine drinking vessel. And standing alongside of it is the McCarthy hurling cup. And the two of them are remarkably similar. Both have square when you look down, both have arms on the edges. And I think that the McCarthy hurling cup was in fact modeled on the containers that some of that bog butter was found on, turned in. Now, have you got an answer to my question? Why do you think it was buried? Yeah, the answers we had a while ago are partly true, but I think there's more to it than that. I wonder, could we think that it might be a ritual difference between the practices that were going on west of the Shannon at that time and what was going on in the rest of the country, and here's why. As I said at the beginning, a lot of the bog butter samples are dated to the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. We we'll go to the Iron Age. During the Iron Age, Ireland became virtually depopulated. There was a crisis, plague or something. And the Druids and the people got very worried. So they started to put their valuables into bogs, into lakes. And that's why so much of them are found there. I'm inclined to think that they looked on butter as a valuable commodity. And I think that's one of the reasons they put it into such attractive vessels. But maybe I'm wrong. Now, the second period I want to deal with is from the medieval onwards, in brief, from the time of St. Patrick up to the establishment of creameries. And you have seen an illustration of the cover of the book already. And I want to stress that that is a Dutch navigation chart that was produced. Now note the date, 1708, 1708, a very early date. What does that tell us? It tells us about the huge importance of the, of the Irish butter trade at that very early age. It was tremendously important, really. And the, in summary, the picture on the cover of the book all, uh, almost tells the full story of the book because it shows cows being milked, it shows butter being made, it shows butter being put into churns and then sold to merchants. Now, how was butter made over a very long time, from ancient times up to the time of the creameries? Well, very simply, we just put milk into flat dishes and left it stand and left the cream rise automatically, naturally, and we skimmed it off. And then we put it into a vessel and we held it until we had sufficient cream to churn. That might take three days. But during that time, the cream would go sour. Well, I shouldn't say sour, would go acidic. In fact, it didn't go sour. It was very important it wasn't allowed to go that far. But it did become acidic. So the butter we produced was acidic. 
So the butter had an acidic taste. And in fact, it is very like the kind of butter that we are now exporting to Germany, lactic or ripened cream butter, and I'll come back to that later. We made some sweet cream butter during that time, but not very much. Now, I want to start talking about technology, given that we're here in Tagus, but not for that reason, but because in the 1600s, 1700s, technology really was brought to bear on the manufacture of butter. In, I'm talking about salting. Salting was the technology that was introduced in the 1600s, 1700s. And I don't think we realize how important a development that was. We all know that heating and sterilization and so forth came in in subsequent years. But the first real technology was the salting that came in in the 1600s, 1700s. The interesting thing about that time is we had to import all the salt we were using. Salt was discovered in Cheshire in England in 1670. We imported it in the 1700s and we set up salt refineries all over the country. There were two or three hundred of them. They were everywhere. And you would know that yourself because you will be aware of the fact that the word salt appears very frequently in no local names. Perhaps the most common is Salt Hill. But they were producing the salt to actually use in preserving butter in particular, and meat for that matter, and fish. Now, some important applications of that salting procedure. In the 15 and 1600s, we were exporting salted fish all over Europe, very extensively. And the technology that was used in that process is well documented in the book. And it is a very interesting technology. And just to get you interested, the process was carried out in what are known as fish palaces. Yeah. Fish palaces. Now, salt, of course, was a very expensive item, and only people like Lord Boyle of Cork or Petty of the Down Survey could afford because we were importing it. But very interestingly, and this is one, st one thing that Butter tells us, in the 1700s, salt became more available to the general population. How do we know that? Because we started to make salted butter on farms, all over, on numerous farms all over Ireland. Now, maybe the people didn't get access to the salt directly. Maybe they got it through the landlords or through the people who were buying butter from them, which was made all over. Salted butter was, so salt was commonly available. Now, making salt is a very sophisticated business because the size of the crystals that are in the salt that you make determines what you can use it for. And they made salt with different sizes of crystals for different food purposes. For curing fish, they deliberately made coarse salt. For curing butter, they made fine grain salt. Now, I want to overstate this so as to get the message take home, taken home. If we didn't have any salt technology, let's pretend all that didn't happen. What would have been the consequence? Very little butter would have been made in farms. There'd have been no export of butter. There'd have been no public butter markets, which I'll come to later. And indeed, there might be no creameries. We did make some cheese. It was an important part of the diet in the early Christian period. And during the 1600s, several kinds of cheese are referred to in the literature. Most of them are soft cheese, but some of them are hard cheese, which were made because it stored longer and was used during the winter period. What's very interesting about Ireland's development in dairy products is that by the mid-1800s, cheese was not commonly made in Ireland. In fact, it was more stark than that. Because in 1900, the Department of Agriculture and Technical Education published a very important report on the status of the dairy industry in 1900. And what did it say? Cheese is not manufactured in Ireland. In fact, we were importing it. During World War I, there was a spike in cheese 
because there was demand in the UK, but the cheese wasn't very good and it was only for a year or two. And in the following decades, cheese manufacture was dormant in Ireland. But in the 1930s, we got involved in a serious way in making cheese. And as I will refer later, Mitch's Down Creameries set the headline in that regard. Now, I'm coming to the third period. In the third period, which is in itself very interesting, because now we were beginning to develop the institutions that were necessary for the commercialization of the butter industry. In particular, we began to develop public butter markets. Public butter markets were a landmark development in the commercialization of the butter industry in the 16 and 1700s. There were public butter markets in quite a few places, and they had to be built by local authorities where butter was weighed and inspected and was of tremendous importance. The most importantly, the most well known one is the Cork Butter Exchange. But it was different from the others in that, number one, it was really obsessed with regulations. And more than that, the board of the co-op seemed to have very few farmers. It seemed to have been mainly merchants, and farmers feature very little. But that's dramatically different in Tipperary in the 1800 in Tipperary town. Farmers were on the board of the co-op. They were involved in selling the product in the co-op, and indeed, so were women. Now, Creameries began to supersede the butter markets at the turn of the century, and it had a dramatic effect on the type of butter we were making, largely because they adopted emerging technology, and in particular, the cream separator, which is illustrated on the cover of the book. That changed everything. For the first time, we could separate fresh milk. We didn't need to leave it. We could therefore produce fresh butter. We therefore could produce what we would all know now as Kerrygold butter. And that was a dramatic change. And in fact, if anyone was ever thinking of having an, a, a, an image of the, the creameries, I would suggest that the cream separator is the most appropriate type. Um, we had a over 200, 200, 300 creameries in the 1920s. Severe rationalization had, was required. And by the turn of the century, all that had happened. We just had six prominent multinational dairy businesses. Four were substantial co-ops, two were major PLCs, and Mitchestown was the lead in that respect, not just in terms of size, but in terms of innovation. It, in fact, I think some will people remember uh, the sponsored programs on the radio uh, every afternoon, the home of good cheese. So it was taking the lead in that, and subsequently it got involved in making processed cheese, and finally in dairy spread. Coming finally towards modern times, we now come to the period where research begins to dominate the issue. I don't want to overstate this, but I do want to state it strongly, because I was involved in it at that time. In the 1960s, we virtually knew nothing about the keeping quality of Irish dairy products, how long they lasted, what determined how long they kept. We knew virtually little. An awful lot of research was done, especially in Moor Park and in UCC. And that provided the foundation of the quality control systems adopted by the creameries. A few examples in milk, in Moorpark, automated methods, methods for testing milk were developed. In butter, that was a major issue for a very long time. Cheese received a lot of attention, and standardized cultures were produced. A lot of work was done on milk powders, especially high heat milk powders. Milk machines came in, and Moorpark made a major contribution to the components in the milk machine and to the cleaning of the milk machine. And finally, bulk tanks came in, and Moorpark, with the industry, developed specifications and improved the performance. Finally, that brings us to the 20th century. 
And now something very strange happens. In the 20th century, in the present century, there was another major transformation of butter. It is very ironical for me to tell you that the butter that we are now very proudly exporting to Germany is in fact the same butter as we were making in prehistoric times. More or less, that is true. In conclusion, Ireland has a long heritage of dairy products. Hopefully, the book will engender a greater appreciation of that. Thank you. Thank you, Liam, uh, for an excellent overview of, of the book. And of course, uh, you're only giving us uh, highlights there. If you want to get the full details, you're going to have to, to buy the book, which is available from wordwellbooks.com, uh, not wordwell, as I, as I mentioned earlier on. So uh, you can uh, pick that up uh, as a, a lovely Christmas present. And, and Liam, uh, thank you for, for giving us those, those milestones throughout the, the history of the, the dairy industry, the, 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 where salt became really important part of the process right through to cream separation. So um, now I'm going to invite uh, Professor Jerry Boyle, uh, who's going to do the official launch of the book for us. So I'll hand over to, to you, Jerry. Thanks, uh, Mark, um, director, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I, I'm absolutely delighted to have been asked by Frank O'Mara to, to launch the publication of this latest work from Liam Downey, of course, and to also acknowledge his co-authors, Dara Downey, who's joining us online, and uh, Gary O'Donovan, who is here with us uh, at Oak Park. But before I, I heap praise on, on the book, I'd like to say that the book's title is a bit of a misnomer, and I think listening to Liam will understand why I say that. This book isn't just about dairy products, although that is the main content. It also covers the topic of pilchards, which I think will be a fascinating subject in its own right for many people, because I was certainly unaware of the importance of that trade for so many years. It also, as Liam has pointed out, covers the critical importance of salt, and there's also a full chapter on um, sugar. But more importantly for me, um, the book is an essay on the importance of innovation in the economic development of Ireland's food industry. And Chagos, among its, among its extensive responsibilities, is charged, of course, with the promotion of scientific inquiry. And this has been delivered to the hugely successful Walsh Scholarship Programme, which was a notable achievement during Liam's tenure as director. But Chagas also, of course, extensively engages in collaborative research with all research performing organizations and in Ireland and with many institutions outside of Ireland. But another area where Chagas has also supported scientific inquiry is through support for publications such as these. Leem's industry since his retirement provides a tremendous example to those of us that have recently retired about how to utilize our time. His dedication to his eclectic interests ranging from ancient Irish history to archeology span as reflected in his many publications over the last 20 years and more is truly extraordinary. He also brings the perspective of the research scientists to these writings, which is absolutely unique. I'm confident in suggesting that not many historians or archaeologists writing anywhere in the world today are in a position to bring to bear the knowledge of an academic chemist to their writings. Liam's knowledge and enthusiasm for chemistry shines through this book. It adds a valuable dimension to the historical narrative throughout. His discussion of bog butter, as we've just heard, for example, is illuminated by this knowledge. Likewise, the thorough descriptions throughout the book of the processes involved in butter and cheese making and in the manufacture of salt and sugar and their use in the preservation of food are clearly written by someone with a deep scientific understanding of various chemical processes. 
chemists in particular enjoyed the discussion on oxidative and hydrolytic rancidity in bog butter. As you read the book, you'll see several references also to personal communications with experts in different processing sectors that reflect the author's anxiety to get the to the scientific core of an issue. The authors are never content to rely on second-hand knowledge. I mentioned a minute ago Liam's prodigious output in his career since his retirement from Chagas. In this book alone, I've counted 15 references to Liam's scholarly work, of which about half were uh, involved Liam as a first author. This is an extraordinary achievement, bearing in mind that it's only a few short years since the publication of the Magisterial Antiquities of Rural Ireland. There are a couple of great features of a great book that this publication has to write. First, you'll want to read several sections over and over again to get to the core of an issue. But secondly, and this is particularly important in an academic publication, there are so many questions that are left for further inquiry. I would suggest that students searching for a good PhD topic will find many good jumping off points in this book. While it's not a core theme of this book, I was fascinated by the reproduction of a chart of Brendan Reardon's on the temperature fluctuations in early modern Irish agriculture and the implications for the development of Ireland's farming systems. I venture to suggest that these insights could be a starting off point for a consideration of the current concerns around climate change. Most of us, I'm sure, are aware of Liam's fascinating writings on bog butter, and Liam has already discussed that in some detail. And this book, of course, elaborates on, on this topic. And he remarks again, and anyone who has the good fortune to purchase this book will be drawn to the resemblance of the wooden butter vessel and, of course, the Liam McCarthy cup. It'll long stay in the mind. And I'm wondering, and there must be some written record somewhere of the inspiration underlying the, the design of that cup, and it would make an interesting paper in its own right. I have to say, though, that the jury is still out for me anyway, as to the motivation behind the storage of butter in the bogs. I can't believe that if butter were buried in the bogs to be retrieved, that so many stashes would go unrecovered. But that's, as Liam says, for another day. I found the discussion of the earlier patterns of consumption particularly fascinating. The underconsumption of fish, for example, requires further examination. In the absence of Friday abstinence, the consumption might have been even less prevalent. But the book clearly brings out the importance of dairy from Neolithic times and especially butter in the diet of Irish people, a period, as Liam has said, an extraordinary period of possibly up to 4,000 years ago. And what's equally fascinating for me in the book are the modern scientific methods used to extract the evidence for butter consumption. Cheese consumption, as Liam says, particularly in the more modern era, seems to have been a, a much later consumption trend and probably didn't become widespread on the development of processed cheese by Mitchellstown creameries in modern times. And uh, we all can remember the processed cheese. I certainly can remember it. It was the mainstay of many a family's consumption. A fascinating number of references in the book are to the relationship between the consumption of food and class. It seems that the poor relied on dairy products, and of course later on potatoes, but the wealthy kept the meat for themselves. There is a lovely quote in the book reproduced from the ancient laws in the 1949 publication by M. O'Shea, which underlines this point so well. And this is a quote. Salt butter to the sons of inferior grades, fresh butter to the sons of chieftains, and honey to the sons of kings. This is book, though, is very much for me a history of innovation. 
the descriptions of the different methods of butter making throughout Ireland is illuminating. And as Liam has drawn our attention also, the central importance of the impact of the breakthrough Swedish technology or Swedish invention of 1878 of the centrifugal cream separator. As Liam has pointed out, is given great prominence in the book and indeed features on the book cover itself. And this is a fascinating study in itself. This technology was clearly superior to traditional largely home produced methods, both in the time to produce the cream and in the, in the yield of butter from, from the milk. But Ireland was unable to capitalize on it in complete contrast to the Danes. And there's a story here. Ireland's share of the UK butter market collapsed from 50% in 1860 to 12% on the eve of the First World War. What's even more remarkable about this collapse is that in the 1870s, in the earlier part of the 1870s, Ireland's dairy industry was initially much larger than Denmark. The reasons for this development have been widely discussed, but I'm sure the debate hasn't been exhausted. But the episode underlines for me the strategic need for a country to be always vigilant and certainly never to be complacent about the ready availability of export markets. Disruptive technologies and consumer sentiment can shift rapidly, and a country has to be always mindful of the, of the need to be innovative. But as Liam points out in the book, tech, innovation isn't just about technology, although clearly technology is central of central importance. The book also charts the critical role played by institutions, such as, as Liam has said, standard setting through the operation of the butter markets and exchanges, and of course, the emergence of the creamery system. It's fitting also that the book concludes with a discussion of the innovation support system that has operated in Ireland over the last 30 to 40 years. This has been led by Anfora Saluntis and later Chagask in collaboration with the institutes of higher education, and of course, the dairy processing companies themselves. And I'm also pleased to note, uh, as this book is published, a new chapter in Ireland's dairy processing innovation system has been opened with the recent establishment of the National Food Innovation Hub at Chagas Moor Park. So in conclusion, I want to warmly commend this book. And indeed, I want to also commend the publishers, Wordwell, for the really impressive production. I acknowledge Liam's co-authors, Dara Downey and Derry O'Donovan. But above all, I want to acknowledge Liam's irrepressibility, his scholarship, and his inexhaustible depth of curiosity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jerry, and uh, really lovely words there. And um, uh, again, uh, highlighting uh, the, the significance of this book. Um, so uh, we're now going to just move to some uh, questions and comments uh, from our panel. And uh, we're delighted to be joined by Dario Donovan uh, here in studio with us. And we also have Dara Downey, who's joining us um, on, online through Zoom. Dara, can you hear us OK? Perfectly, yep, loud and clear. Right. Well, I might turn to you first, Dara, and uh, maybe just to talk, uh, talk us uh, around, talk to us about the, the, the pivotal role that women had to play in this uh, innovative journey of, of dairy products. It's very clear from the book, you know, of that, that important role that women had to play. They really did. Um, and I mean, I think sometimes when, you know, if, if we're talking about butter in particular, the way that people talk about butter making can sometimes become a little bit abstract. And what we really need to remember was that this was, as you say, this was kind of one of the jobs that women performed on farms, whether large farms or small farms. Um, it was something that occasionally women would have to spend large portions of their day doing because occasionally the butter just wouldn't come. You could be churning and churning and churning for hours and it just wouldn't happen. Um, so, you know, they were literally there at the coal face ensuring that the butter was going to be something that could be consumed and, you know, sold after that. Um, 
as my father was also saying earlier, there were some public butter markets um, where there seems to be evidence that women were permitted to show up um, to be part of the, the selling process. Um, now, it's something that I think uh, merits further exploration, you know, how much women would have been involved in the, the kind of commercial end of all of that. But certainly, I think none of this would have happened without women's labour. And there was also a very strong connection uh, with the, the political uh, system at the time. We talked about uh, the, the importance of the plantations uh, at the time and that linkage with exports. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that or help us understand that a little bit more. Yes, definitely. Um, I mean, I have to say that just one of the things that really jumped out at me while we were working on this book was how much the the kind of specter of the Great Famine loomed over everything that we were talking about as a, a sort of pivotal moment in the history of Irish food production generally. Um, because, you know, at, as my father was saying earlier, we were quite good at making food for a very long time as a country. And, you know, it, it's a, a fertile country and we were we had systems for making butter and making cheese and, and all kinds of other things. And then, as you say, the plantations happen, the enclosure of the land happens. So you move from um, the book talks a lot about the, the Rundale system of farming, which is the open field system with the infield, the outfield and the commonage. Um, and then when that was enclosed uh, for the purposes of producing more stuff more quickly, it meant that farmers lost an awful lot of autonomy over what they were producing. Um, and, you know, as Jerry Boyle was saying there, um, this book is only a small part of the work that my father has been doing over the last 20 years or so. Um, and over the weekend, we were working on an article on the, the role of the potato in um, sort of Irish food systems. And one of the things that we, um, that my dad really kind of came up with was that there was a certain point in sort of the early 1800s where the uh, indigenous Irish population were no longer consuming butter because it was being exported and therefore were reliant on the potato. So I think, you know, one of the things that really kind of comes through in this book is that while often sort of 19th century commentators tended to see the Irish as lazy, as not very good at farming or as kind of dealing with very marginal land that wasn't fertile. None of these things were actually true. This was something that happened, as you say, because of the, the political situation um, and because of capitalism, essentially. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Tara. Uh, I'd like to now bring uh, Derry into the discussion. And uh, Derry, can you tell me what, what can the Irish dairy industry learn from this book? Well, I think it is very important that we look back at history. And in that connection, I think in the, in the forward to the book, Jerry Boyle made reference to the fact that some countries have capitalized very well on their historical cultural heritage, particularly pointing at France with regard to both cheese and wine. I think our book tracks, documents and confirms, as Liam and Jerry said earlier, that we have been making butter in this country for up to 4,000 years. And I think this is very important in that it highlights the tremendous food heritage we have here in Ireland. And this, I believe, enhances the attractiveness and the authenticity of our dairy products on global markets, which we see in particular with Kerrygold, at a time when consumers are looking for and even demanding that they want pure natural food sustainably produced. We can, we can now offer that on the global stage with a degree of you know, confidence and uh, it, it is very important. Mentioning food heritage, I think it is now a growing segment worldwide of the, of the tourism sector, which is a rapidly growing sector globally. And we have a wonderful story to tell in that connection. And I think, if I may suggest, that Falcher Erden, who have been outstanding and brought Falter before them in bringing tourists into our little green misty island, that they should uh, be maybe listing our book, Historical Irish Dairy Products, at tourist office 
because it is a well-known fact that any overseas tourists who come to Ireland, they do visit a tourist office at least once during their visit, and that would be very good. I think the other place where the book could offer uh, uh, an interest is we now know that the trade portfolio uh, in the current government attaches to the Foreign Affairs Department. And we have embassies all over the world, many of them uh, supported with agricultural attaches. And I think that would be another vehicle to present that situation and to tell the story. And while I have the floor, Mark, if I may, I think the, the, the location for this book launch is both uh, appropriate and significant. Jory made reference earlier to the research book, but I think it is for somebody who didn't work in uh, Chagas or in Unferris to Lunchish. I think over the past 60 years, the research and development which has issued from those two organizations for Agri-Food Ireland in the sports context, but more importantly, for underpinning the global development and success of the, the dairy industry and particularly Kerry Gold. And I think that is significant that we have achieved that. Jory made reference as well to the fact that the new innovation hub is uh, a further indication that uh, Chagas intends to continue a leadership role in supporting the dairy industry into the future. But more importantly, I think this new hub will act as a major catalyst for small food SMEs and in particular artisan dairy producers throughout Ireland. And that will enable them to commercialize their new product offering. And then that in turn can lead to the establishment of viable small food businesses throughout rural Ireland, creating jobs and contributing as well at the same time to ret the retention of the social fabric of rural Ireland. And finally, when there was a lot of mention made to the vessel that bog butter was discovered in, and it would appear that the McCarthy Cup was modelled on that. I think there are just one or two other little interesting features, seeing that Limerick are dominating that whole sphere at the moment. <laughs> and it is, the first farmer-controlled creamery established in Ireland was in hospital. The first farmer co-op creamery in Ireland was in Drumcolliher. They both are in Limerick. Number two, the first pharma-controlled creamery and hospital was opened in 1884. Another significant date in the GA calendar, which was when the GA was founded in Hayes' Hotel in, in Thurless. So you can see it's almost back to the future in many respects. And we can also see that uh, the I suppose the co-op industry, and on our way down today, Liam was just showing me where uh, the co-op leader resided in, in, in Kiltira House in Fox Rock, and uh, you know to see now uh, the new Ireland being developed. And I think we believe that this book can, you know, as we're 10 days out from Christmas, and people, as you said earlier, Mark, are wondering what will they buy by way of a little Christmas gift for a parent or grandparent. And in the light that we will possibly be uh, locked up again this uh, Christmas or confined to barracks, I think to bring that book home to your parents or grandparents, particularly if they're farmers or if they had any involvement or connection with the dairy industry, like many retired premium managers, I think this would make a most wonderful Christmas present. Thank you, Darian. I agree with you about the, the tourism potential. I think Fulcher Ireland were presenting Ireland as the food island last year, so I think that fits very well with what uh, you're, 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 you're presenting there. Um, Frank, uh, it, it, this, this brings us up to modern day, the, the, the research and the innovation that's taking place within, the, in, within Chagas. Maybe you could bring us up to the, the, the up to date on, in terms of what's happening within Chagask uh, around uh, dairy product development. Absolutely, Mark, and I was just reflecting as, as Liam was talking about the, you know, the innovations that were important, whether it was salt or whether it was the invention of the separator. And, you know, you look now, you, you drive down or drive past Moorpark and you see the, 
the, the incredible uh, facilities and infrastructure that's there now to support innovation in, in the dairy industry. And it's an enormous contrast. And, and, and you add to that, like not just the, the capability that's in Chagas, but you know, in the other research institutions in the country, the universities and the, the Dairy Processing Technology Centre, which is an Enterprise Ireland funded uh, venture between the state, Enterprise Ireland and the dairy co-ops and the in-house capability that's in the, the cooperatives themselves. Like it's, you know, there, there's a tremendous, I suppose, capability in the country uh, around that. And look at, you know, as with any industry, it contrasts, I suppose, with where, where, it, where it has come from. And Liam, it was fascinating listening to you. Sorry enough, we're going on a small bit before I get to your question, Mark. But you know, the, the importance of both salt, but also the importance of the, the separator. And, you know, when we look at the, the facilities now and the, the, the manufacturing plants that we have for butter, and you think back to think that that all started with a simple separator. To me, the, the parallel that came into my mind was the, you know, computers now are so pervasive in terms of how we live, in terms of this event that we're running today, you know, it, it's all running on ICT technology. And you go back and it's not that long ago, the Turing machine, you know, which was, the, the, was so simple, uh, but yet that has led to all this fantastic mm -hmm. development in, in com communications and ICT and computing. And the separator, I suppose, was the same in terms of how that has led on to the fantastic uh, industry that we have today now around butter and around dairy products. So in terms of, look, you know, the, the, um, the capability that, that we have now or the interest we have now, and, and look, Liam, you were part of that, that story in Moorpark yourself, and I think your, your own chemistry and biochemistry background was, was coming out there when you were talking about the nature of the, the bog butter after its years and years and the way it had turned into a soap and that you're expertise was shining through but you know there's 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 a huge i suppose range of expertise now is what i would see as the difference in the last couple of decades in terms of you know the type of scientific um uh, uh inquiry that we have it, it's it's goes right through from that that chemistry and through to the structure of of dairy products and you know exam being able to, the depth with which we can examine them now not just chemical analysis but also micro microscopic analysis and the way we can look at you know the, the the structure of dairy products at, a, at an incredibly detailed level with electron microscopes and and now moving on into the, the virtual reality and the augmented reality as ways of studying the, the the characteristics of products and then you move from that into the the impact i suppose the big advance maybe that we've made in the last decade or two has been the ability to study the impact of food and in more park in particular dairy products on the health of people and how I suppose that that is mediated through the gut microbiota. You know, you, we eat the food and it's it's absorbed into our, our gut, and, and the, the the microbiome there is very much impacted by what you eat, and that has a huge impact on on your your health and your well being and so on. And and you know, it's 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 a, been a fantastic journey, I suppose, from from first of all maybe under, trying to understand the chemistry and physical characteristics of of butter and other products right through to that now where we're looking in, in huge depth at, at that aspect of, of, um, of food science. And mm -hmm. I suppose, look, that all that range of capability is now brought to bear and available to our food industry. There was a, a very uh, significant development within Chagas in recent years, uh, allowing further exports of, of cheeses. And uh, maybe you could just talk, tell us about that for a moment yeah, well, so because looking, I, I think that is quite a significant uh, absolutely development. Probably, probably one of the the more most exciting technologies that we were involved in developing in in the last decade or two was this ability basically to 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 um make cheese from reconstituted uh, milk so in other words we can now dry the milk convert it into a powder export the powder to another uh, any part of the world reconstitute it and make uh, any type of cheese there and in particular i suppose the interest here is in making uh shorter shelf life cheeses you know that that where you don't want to be transporting them long distances maybe where you can get the local flavors and and um local characteristics of cheese making where that's important that you, you can do that so so with the technology that we developed uh or newer actually built a plant in in saudi arabia to make local cheeses labneh cheeses uh using that that technology and you know for us to have made those cheeses in Ireland and exported them would not really have worked, but now to be able to, to uh, dry the milk, export the powder and make the cheeses there is, is a fantastic development. 
Okay, we're, we're coming close to the end of our, our launch uh, today. We have some comments coming in uh, from people just uh, in relation to the, the Mark McCarthy uh, Cup. Uh, some, I suppose, op opinions or observations. Uh, one person is saying here, it is not likely that an answer uh, uh, to be the, for the handheld or the handled cup uh, for bog butter might lie in spiritual, uh, religious world or pre-Christian times. Uh, the McCarthy Cup was a communal cup passed laterally uh, to, to this person's knowledge, whereas the Sam Maguire was a cup based on the chalice. Um, one connects heaven and earth and the other uh, Earth-based, so uh, interesting comment on that there, and also um, uh, in the context of uh, the GAA uh, in 1922, Lee McCarthy approached, or sorry, Lee McCarthy approached the GAA and offered to commission a trophy for the winners of the All Ireland Senior Hurling Championships, and modelled uh, on an ancient drinking vessel known as Mether, yeah. uh, the or Mether, the, the Lee McCarthy Cup was. Uh, wrought by uh, Edmund Johnson Jewellers of Grafton Street, Dublin, and cost £50. Pounds. So that's uh, an extract from the, uh, the, the GAA uh, uh, website, I believe. Um, so there's, there's a huge interconnections there, Liam, over, over the years uh, in relation to food and sport there, is there not? There's no doubt about that, really. Um, Certainly, uh, well, it's not too surprising that the mm. two are connected because mm. they're both sort of cultural things. Mm. But while I have the floor for a second, I want to thank the people for the very kind comments that they made about me. Mm -hmm. But I want to make it very clear, if I can, Mark, that without Dara and without Derry O'Donovan, this book would never, ever have been done. They both played a huge part and I would like to acknowledge that very strongly. Well, we have uh, Dara, Dara and Derry can, can, can hear that loud and clear and um, before we, we wrap up, um, Jerry, uh, you're, you're uh, back in Oak Park probably for the first time since uh, you retired and uh, you're uh, one of more recently. Um, the, the development of the the dairy industry there has been huge developments uh, during your time as director as well. Um, would you have any reflections for us on your, your time in, in, in relation to uh, and, and, and connected to this book as well? Well, I mean, Frank has, has said most of what, what I would like to say in respect of the technological developments. But for me, and it's a point broader than this book, when we think of innovation, we sometimes make the mistake of thinking exclusively in terms of technology. And, and of course, technology is critically important. But the institutional development is, is if anything, more important. And we sometimes take it for granted. Like as Liam said, the emergence of, of the butter exchanges and it, uh, was hugely important in terms of trying to manage quality, which was a huge issue in the marketplace. And of course, the Irish, being the Irish, managed to find ways to get around it as well. So it probably was never as perfect as it might be. The development of the creamery system, that was an extraordinary development. And in modern times, then, we have the emergence of the PLCs. Um, we have different approaches uh, to collaborative research. I mean, Frank referred to Enterprise Ireland's uh, the processing centre, the dairy processing centre, for example and they've uh, counterparts in meat and so on. Uh, and we'd say, well, collaboration sure is something obvious. Collaboration is damn difficult, mm. I can tell you. And it needs to be nurtured and incentivized. So I would signal out those developments. And the other thing at the latter end of my period as director and under Frank's leadership, we saw something very obvious happening, you might say, after the fact. Greater integration between production and processing in terms of the potential for innovation and processing to be directed from the primary production of the milk itself. And that leads to all sorts of interesting possibilities in terms of the role of genetics and so on in enabling product differentiation. Um, so I think we're heading back towards a much more uh, closely meshed value chain in the system. And just, sorry, if I might have one point and just picking up on Dara's comment about the importance of women. Liam brings out in the book, and Liam and Dara and Derry rather, bring out in the book, the importance of cheese production in, in Mitchellstown. 
but the role also of the Munster Institute. I know it is a topic very close to Liam's heart, and he's written extensively about it. But it was women produced the cheese. That's just fact. I know it extended out of the home production and so on. Uh, but in the processing of cheese in the early days, the, the importance of good training, good education, I think was absolutely critical. And the Munster Institute, you'd agree, Liam, was to the fore in that. Uh, Thank I, you, Mark. I would endorse that very strongly. Mm -hmm. I don't think that the contribution of the Munster Institute, and hence the contribution of women, in terms of butter making, in terms of cheese making, in terms of poultry, is adequately recognised at all. I think they made a wonderful contribution, and it was a tragedy to see it go. Mm -hmm. Dara, I see you ag agreeing there. Uh, <laughs> would you like to add anything to that uh, part of the discussion? Um, yes, very much. I, I had been thinking for the last 10 minutes that I should actually have mentioned the Munster Institute, um, which, as Jerry was saying there, my, my father has written on before in the past. Um, and it's, you know, it, it was a fascinating development um, and it was a real shame that it vanished. I mean, I think perhaps in this day and age, that kind of gender segregation wouldn't really fly in the same way. But at the same time, I think the idea that you know, kind of food production in relation to farming can be something that, you know, involves training on a, a sort of smaller home level is coming back to some of the things that Derry was talking about as well, about the development of small business and, and you know, the opportunity that we have here to, as he was saying, to sort of capitalize on, I think, the romance of our history in terms of, of butter making in particular. I mean, surely, everyone wants to know slightly mysterious stuff about bogs and I don't think that we've really capitalized on that enough at all um so yeah I think that there is this is a huge part of our history and our heritage um as my dad was saying you know both the role of women um and as Derry was talking about kind of smaller cottage industries and and I think going forward this is something that we should dig up a little bit more okay thank you Dara and uh, thank you thank you everybody for your contributions now I'd like to Ask maybe Frank to um, if to close out today's session uh, with some final remarks. And uh, uh, before we just hand over to Frank, I'd just like to say thank you to to Dara Downey, Liam Downey, Jerry Boyle, and Derry O'Donovan for excellent contribution today. And I'll hand right over to Frank now. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. And look, I will be I will be very brief. Um, first of all, look, I. Liam, I think you were very kind in your remarks about your co-authors, uh, Dara and Derry, and I'm sure they're totally uh, deserved in terms of, of the role, what you said about the role that they, they played uh, in the production of this book. But I've no doubt you were the inspiration and that you were the driving force uh, behind this book. So I'd very much like to commend you and, and your two authors in terms of, of um, th this, this product that you have produced. And I'd also very much like to commend uh, Jerry for his wisdom in sponsoring this book. You know, I think it's really important that Chagas, you know, we're okay, we're a science organization mm -hmm. and so on, but that we also do uh, do, do put some effort in, into recognizing some of the finer points around the agriculture industry and the history is, is, is one of those. And likewise, I think Wardwell have done a fantastic job in producing a, a beautiful quality uh, production of, of this book. And look, you know, we, we've had, I think, a good chat there. So I, I had some of the points I've, I've actually made them that I was going to make. But um, one thing I would like maybe to, to touch on it, um, briefly, and that's the last point we ended, uh, which was Dara's point earlier around the role of, of women. And I, I don't, you know, we, we've discussed that a little bit. But for me, um, I was reflecting as we were listening to the, the last, uh, the, the various contributions of the last hour, how um, this book actually, to some extent, charts uh, the role of women um, in, in society and in industry and maybe how it, how it mirrors or charts or, or chronicles the, the journey of women towards equality. And um, you, know, you can see all the, the various steps and, and parallels uh, that we, we, when we look at any, when we look at that journey in any, any detail coming out in the story of, of women and uh, butter and cheese making. Um, I think another point that, that's well worth making uh, is the the way that uh, the story of, of butter intertwines with our, our political history and you know in terms of how land use and land ownership uh, you know impacted on that and we, we saw the, 
the rise of cheese production, the fall of cheese production, the rise again of cheese production, and, and the same with our butter exports, and how the political, uh, um, I suppose, organisation at the time uh, was, was at, the, at the cause, maybe, of some of those uh, changes. And, and, and that, to me, was, was very interesting as well. And I think because of all of that, and, and you know, some of the, the facts that, that Liam has, has mentioned, you know, that we have the oldest scientifically dated butter in, in the world, and um, you know the, the the some of the the rise of the butter markets and the co-ops and so on. There's a really rich uh, story there, a really rich heritage around that. And I, I think Derry, you made the point that maybe we don't make enough uh, of of that heritage uh, when we're we're talking about the, the product that is in a, that is Ireland as a tourist destination. And I think Derry, it was a good suggestion that this book should be brought the attention of, of Fall to Ireland and the various uh, tourist offices uh, that we have around the country because I've no doubt uh, it would um, it would arise the interest of many of the people that visit those those tourist centers and th the last point I, I wanted to make uh, again um, that that struck me you know from the discussion we've had is I suppose the centrality of the role of co-ops and maybe you can trace back through to the the butter markets and the creameries and and now the co-ops and and really they have been uh, and, and still are um, a hugely important part of the, the dairy industry he, here in Ireland. And allied to that then was the, I suppose, the contribution that science was able to make and that indeed policy was able to make. And, uh, you know, I was struck Liam, by your, your comments on the milking machines. And, you know, when we think of butter and cheese, we, we probably think of the processing end of things and the technologies, whether it was separation or salt that, that allowed that, but also hugely important uh, to the development of our modern uh, dairy industry was the development around milking machines and, and that whole process of actually harvesting milk from cows. So look, it's it's been a fascinating hour, actually. I, I found it really, really interesting to have this discussion. I'm sure you did too, and I'm sure it probably provoked a lot of different thought strains in you than it, it did in me, and I think that that's wonderful. So I'd like to, to close off really now by um, saying goodbye to all of you, and thank you for joining us here uh, this afternoon. And um, to, to finish by just thanking Mark for organizing and hosting uh, this event and sharing the, the event and, and the discussion. And to our two uh, production uh, geniuses, Declan McArdle and Patrick O'Connor, who have uh, uh, you know, put, put on the, 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 um, the, the show that you have seen for the last hour. And it's, it's wonderful that in these days of COVID, when we have to have a certain degree of isolation, that we can still connect out with an audience through the, the digital technologies that we, we now to bring to bear in our communications. So with that, I bid you all adieu and thank you very much for joining us for the afternoon.